the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This is a documentary account of the situation in the Pacific, of the men and events which are today influencing world affairs for generations to come. Transition in India. Prime Minister Attlee was on his feet in the parliamentary debate in the House of Commons. I am quite certain that the tide of nationalism is running very fast in India, and indeed all over Asia. In the Netherlands Indies, in French Indochina, as well as in India, the old colonial system was crumbling. I hope that India may elect to remain within the British Commonwealth. If, on the other hand, she elects independence, in our view, she has the right to do so. It will be for us to help make the transition as smooth as possible. Transition. Britain was in the process of giving India self-government. But giving India back to the Indians contemplated enormous difficulties. In whose hands would it be placed? The Indians are divided. 250 million Hindus on one side, 92 million Muslims on another not to mention the other minorities. For a good many years, two conflicts have been going on simultaneously in India. This is an observer. The first conflict has been between the Indian nationalists on one side and the British government on the other. This conflict has revolved around the question of when India was to be freed. This conflict has been going on for many years. The second conflict has been between the Hindus and the Muslims on the question of how the power to be transferred to the Indians is to be shared between them. There are some very strong ideas about this. We, 92 million Muslims, are a nation. We will never submit to domination by the Hindus. Pakistan, Zindabad! This is the Muslim position. They envisage a separate nation of their own, Pakistan. The only hope of India is as a unified nation under a democratic form of government. We will never permit secession of the Muslims. Nothing on earth, including the United Nations, is going to bring about the Pakistan of Jinnah's conception. This is the Hindu position. Today, in the matter of transition, the British government stands between the Muslims and the Hindus, searching for some common ground on which they can be brought together without strife and possibly without actual civil war. Last spring, the British government saw its problem as a short-term consideration and a long-term consideration. The short-term problem is to find some way of associating the Congress Party and the Muslim League in an interim government to see India through the period while her constitution is being hammered out. This is a British spokesman. The long-term problem is to set up machinery for framing the new constitution on a basis which would enable all parties to cooperate. But the main difficulty was the diametrically opposed views of the Hindus and the Muslims. Besides their political rivalry, there is a wide religious gulf between them. The Muslims have a simple, austere faith. They have one god and one prophet. The Hindus worship many gods and have great veneration for the cow. The Muslims slaughter and eat the cow. On the other hand, the Hindus anger the Muslims by playing music before the Muslim mosque. In addition to these differences, the Hindus and the Muslims are miles apart in matters of business. The Hindus, years ago, took to Western education and Western business. Today, most of the big business of India, the banking and insurance, are monopolized by the Hindus. The Muslims have been slower to enter these fields, so many of them are in the position of being workmen for the Hindus. Yes. If we agreed to a federal India, the Hindus would freeze us out of the government as they have frozen us out in industry. In 
1945, a conference had been called at Simla to deal with the short-term problem, that of getting the Congress Party and the Muslim League together in an interim government. This failed. In the spring of 1946, the British Labor government then sent three cabinet ministers to India. These three, known as the Cabinet Mission, were Lord Patrick Lawrence, Secretary of State for India, Sir Stafford Cripps, President of the Board of Trade, and A.V. Alexander, First Lord of the Admiralty. The chief Indian leaders met with them. We wish it to be plain that we have come to India to conclude a final agreement. The choice of the future status of India lies with India itself. Our first task is to set up an interim government. The British cabinet minister spoke, and the Indian leaders listened. Then they spoke. Speaking for the 92 million Muslims, we will join in setting up a provisional government only if the principle of a complete Muslim separate state is conceded first. This is impossible. Speaking for the 250 million Indians who are represented in the Congress party, we will not take part in any proceedings, the objective of which is two separate Indias. The conference was deadlocked before it got started on the question of whether India would be divided into one part for Muslims and another part for Hindus. What Jinnah proposes is two separate sovereign states in the north of India, one in the northwest, one in the northeast. These areas he would make a Muslim state and call it Pakistan. But the Hindus have pointed out repeatedly that this is not the answer to the communal question. First, because there is a mass of Hindu territory 600 miles in length between the two isolated areas in the northeast and the northwest. Second, because many of the population of the two proposed Muslim areas are not Muslim. Conversely, many Muslims live in the areas which, under this arrangement, would be in the Hindu section. There's also another reason, you might say, a more vital one. This is a Hindu the two sections of the suggested Pakistan contain the two most vulnerable frontiers of India. If India were attacked in these quarters, the situation would be grave, for there is insufficient area in Pakistan for a successful defense in depth. The talks lasted ten days. Then they broke down. No agreement was reached on an interim government. To effect the transfer of authority, the British made an offer with six sharply defined provisions. There should be a union of India, embracing both British India and the states to deal with foreign affairs, defense, and communications, and to have the powers necessary to raise the requisite finances. The union shall have an executive and legislature, composed of British Indian and state representatives. And any question raising a major communal issue in the legislature shall be decided by a majority of the representatives present in voting of each of the two major communities as well as a majority of all the members present and voting. All portfolios other than the union portfolios and all residuary powers shall be vested in the provinces. The state shall retain all portfolios and powers other than those ceded to the union. The provinces shall be free to form groups with executives and legislatures. Each group to determine the provincial portfolios to be taken in common. The Constitution of the Union and of the group shall contain provisions whereby any province, by a majority vote of its legislative assembly, may call for a reconsideration of the terms of the Constitution after an initial period of ten years, and at ten-year intervals thereafter. In addition to these points, the new Indian government would have to decide India's relation to the British Commonwealth and Empire. We hope that the new independent India may choose to be a member of the British Commonwealth. In any event, we hope that India will remain in close and friendly association with our people. But these matters are for your own free choice. Whatever that choice may be, we look forward with you to your ever-increasing prosperity among the greatest nations of the world and to a future even more glorious than your past. Thus, the British plan was to set up a federal union embracing all the provinces and all the states of the Maharajas. This part of the proposal is good. It conceives of India as a sovereign republic. The British plan proposed, however, that the federal union be limited to dealing with international affairs, defense, and communication. We uh, Muslims would agree to this. 
it it permits us to form a regional bloc of Muslims within the Union. Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the Muslim League voted in favor of the plan. But there were fireworks in the offing. Nevertheless, for the next few weeks, things were to go relatively smoothly. Nehru gave his approval to the plan. So on June 25th, 1946, the Hindu-dominated Congress party, after long delay, conditionally endorsed the long-term plan, but refused to join an interim government. Four days later, the fireworks went off. The Muslim League revokes its support of the plan. The Viceroy has not asked me to form an interim government. <laughs> we withdraw our support of the British proposal. And I accuse the British and the Congress Party of working together to the disadvantage of us Muslims. We will have no part of trying to work on a plan on this basis. And henceforth, we will resort to direct action. <laughs> Direct action was to have special and terrible meaning in the time to come. The Viceroy, after long discussion, invited Nehru, the president of the Congress Party, to form a new interim government, an all-Indian government, regardless of the Muslims. The month before this, the Muslims had met in a hall in Bombay, and one after another Muslim, titled by the British in times past, renounced their honors. By these actions, let the world know that we protest with all that is in us against the collaboration of the British with the Congress Party. Once, for me, I accepted British knighthood. Now, I give it back to the British. Britain was placed in a difficult situation. If when the Muslims revoked their support of the British plan, the British had withdrawn the plan, they would have solidified the Indian sentiment against them. By supporting the Congress Party, they threw their support to the vast majority of Indians. But Britain knows the temper of the Muslims. She knows the power of the Muslims in the Middle East. And she does not wish to risk their hostility. So, asking Nehru, a Hindu, to form an interim government, regardless of the Muslims, was a dangerous but necessary maneuver. <laughs> up a slate of 14 seats for the interim government. Six of these were Hindus from the Congress Party. One was a Muslim from the Congress Party. Two were independent Muslims. Three were representatives of other minorities. And two more seats were reserved for the Muslims. This would give the Muslims five of the 14 seats. Jinnah and the Muslim League refused to cooperate. In the interest of sound representation in the interim government, I ask that the Muslim League reconsider and accept the five seats in the cabinet set aside for Muslims. Jinnah refused to budge. Jinnah was in a position to make a strong move. He could reconsider and call off the Muslim League boycott of the interim government. Or he could encourage even more active opposition, such as non-payment of taxes, resignation of Muslims from public offices, and even active demonstrations of Muslims against the government. Or he could bide his time and prepare for a decisive move when the time came. Muslim leaders had ideas about biding their time. What can they do without us? Look at the troubles in India. Unemployment and labor unrest. Inadequate transportation. The danger of famine. And all the other things. How can the interim government do business without us? It is not necessary for us to take measures against the interim government. It will collapse of its own weakness in a matter of months. As the British, the Hindus, and the minorities waited for Jinnah to act, they remembered Jinnah's tactics in the past. The Hindus oppressed us when they were in power in the provincial government. This was Jinnah, who in 1940 bitterly attacked the recent Congress Party government in the provinces. The only course open to us all is to allow the major nations of India to separate to their homeland. Any government in India which gives Muslims a position inferior in political power to the Hindus must lead to civil war and the raising of private armies. They remembered that in 1940. And they remembered his position in 1942 when after the failure of the Crips mission, the Hindus undertook a policy of civil dis disobedience. The Muslim League will take no part in the Hindu civil disobedience. And for this, the British are fortunate. For if we did, 
The British would have 500 times more troubles because we have 500 times more guts. <laughs> and so the British and the Congress Party waited. And when Jinnah did not name Muslims to the cabinet of the interim government, the Viceroy appointed Muslims who were not members of Jinnah's Muslim League. Violence resulted. There he is. Coming out now. Yes. Get your knives ready. Come on, careful. Do not let him see us. He sees us. He's starting to run. Come on now, quick now. You will not escape. You traitor, you will not escape. Help, help, police. It will do you no good to help, squeal. Help, police. Grab him. I grab him. I have him. him. Let me go. You let will go. accept the post in the help. Hindu government, will you? Help. Help. This is your reward for betraying your people. Get off, get off me. Help. Police. 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 Here come the police. Here come the police. Come the police. Yes, sir. Oh. 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 They've cut so badly. Who are they? Oh. Do not know. They were Muslims, were they not? Oh. Why would they attack a Muslim like you? Get me to a hospital. Get me to a hospital. Oh. oh. You are to Shepherd Ahmad Khan. Get me to a hospital. But this was to be a very small part of what was to happen. Jinnah had spoken of direct action. Now he named a direct action day against the plan advanced by Britain for Indian independence. The streets of Calcutta were quiet as the day started, quiet except for the bitterness that rankled within many who walked the streets, but who would soon be dead. shelter or roamed in groups in search of food. Outraged women and children died along with the others, and vultures fed on them as they did on the fanatics who had died with torches or weapons in their hands. This fratricidal war is a disgrace. This was Jinnah's reaction. Jinnah's reaction is obscure in the light of the fact that it was he who named Direct Action Day. Jinnah must certainly have known what would happen when he called for direct action, especially when the chief minister of Bengal, who is also a Muslim, proclaimed Direct Action Day a holiday. This, if it meant nothing to anyone else, could only be construed by the more radical Muslims as being for the express purpose of giving them an opportunity to attack the Hindus. How many died in the riot, how great the damage, perhaps never will be known. But Pandit Nehru summed up the situation in a line. Either direct action knocks the government over, or the government knocks direct action over. Then Jinnah, who had steadfastly refused to take part in the interim government, agreed to accept the Viceroy's invitation to name five Muslims to the All India Cabinet. Thus, the short-term problem, that of setting up an interim government with both Hindus and Muslims, was achieved. And now the long-term problem, that of working out a constitution for the new independent India, was undertaken. But there were rocks and shoals ahead. Hardly 
Hardly had the five Muslims been named when rumors began making the rounds. Jinnah has not named the best qualified Muslims to the interim government for a definite reason. For what reason? If you want my opinion, because he does not propose to cooperate at all. Rather, he will obstruct. Obstruct? I have reports that the members he has named to the government will not only obstruct, but will try to break up the interim government. Meanwhile, Pandit Nehru made a trip to the Muslim-dominated country, Northwest Frontier Province, waiting for him at the airport with thousands of Muslims and Muslim sympathizers. Nehru alighted from the plane and with his party got into cars. Most of them have guns and spears. Uh, they look angry. Who? Oh, they are throwing rocks at us. They are throwing rocks at us. Proceed, no driver. Pay no attention to them. There was no mistaking the attitude of the Muslims. Nevertheless, as planned, Nehru later mounted the platform to speak. The Muslims first listened, then walked out. And miles away, the bad blood between the Muslims and the Hindus was manifested in terms even more unmistakable. was quiet again, some 5,000 lay dead. The distance between the Muslims and the Hindus had not lessened one whit. Still worse riots broke out in Bihar. In an effort to find some kind of common ground upon which they could consider India's independence, an invitation was extended to the leaders of both parties to come to London for a conference. Jinnah accepted, Nehru accepted. And together, in the same plane, along with Viceroy Wavell and Sikh Defense Minister Sardar Singh, they flew to London. Jinnah and Nehru could not agree on a question of interpretation of two sections of the plan advanced by the British cabinet mission. Jinnah took one view, the British agreed with him. Nehru refused to agree to this interpretation. Jinnah asked that the convocation of the Constituent Assembly be postponed from December 9th. Viceroy Wavell refused to postpone the Constituent Assembly. Jinnah said that 73 Muslim League delegates would not attend. Back of all this, Jinnah was fighting for Pakistan, and Nehru was fighting against it. And so there was a deadlock. Into this impasse then stepped Prime Minister Clement Attlee. Should a constitution come to be framed by a constituent assembly in which a large section of the Indian population had not been represented, His Majesty's government could not, of course, contemplate forcing such a constitution upon any unwilling parts of the country. To this, the Congress had agreed that if the 92 million Muslims were not represented in the Constituent Assembly, that the Constitution could not be forced upon them. And implicit in this statement by the Prime Minister was a warning that the British government would not turn India over to a Congress Party government. How can we solve here in a few days a problem that has been an issue for months? This was Nehru's reaction. What they could not settle in India, they could not settle in London. If Nehru and Jinnah could not get together on a question of procedure, they had no common grounds on which to meet. So Nehru went home. The London talks broke down. But the Constituent Assembly was still scheduled to open in New Delhi on December 9th, with or without the Muslims. As the days of the weekend passed between the ending of the London talks and the opening of the Constituent Assembly in New Delhi, concern grew as to the explosive situation between the Muslims and the Hindus in India. Remember what happened in Calcutta? Yes. And what happened in the Nohali district of Bengal? It's gone far beyond control by either the Muslims or the Hindus. Or by the British, for that matter. If you ask me, forces have been let loose now that no one can control. Almost anything will set it off. Yes. You read what Jinnah said before he left London. 
said that the Muslims would never submit to the sacrifice of their political and religious identity. Nobody's asking them to do that. He says that's what Britain's plan for independence for India would amount to. In New Delhi and throughout India, everyone who understood the situation held his breath as the Constituent Assembly convened on Monday, December 9th. Seated were the 221 delegates of the Congress Party representing the 260 million Hindus and the minority groups. Absent were the 73 delegates of the Muslim League. The Assembly got underway. Dr. Rajendra Prasad, a member of the Congress Party, was elected chairman of the Assembly. Observers looked on. They'll probably start by adopting resolutions declaring India a sovereign nation. Well, they can't go very far without taking some action on those interpretations of the British cabinet mission plan that caused the breakdown in London. They'll have to ask a federal court for an interpretation. Mm-hmm. But in the face of what Prime Minister Radley said in London about not turning power over to the Congress party, how far are they going here without the Muslim delegates? This is one of the momentous questions. A constitution acceptable to the British government cannot be worked out without the Muslims, and the Muslims are boycotting the assembly. Jinnah is an able and experienced politician. He may soon find it expedient to consult the Council of the Muslim League on participation in the constituent assembly. It's possible that he may keep the Muslim delegates out of the assembly for some time, possibly for months, until the assembly gets down to considering the details of provincial groupings. Now, that is where Jinnah's greatest concern rests. For with the proper setup and these considerations, he can, in effect, achieve some measure of his Pakistan. But almost before the assembly got underway, there was evidence that the tension between the Muslims and the Hindus was still at fever pitch. Violence is flaring anew between the Muslims and the Hindus in the northwest Punjab province. Muslim tribesmen have attacked Hindus in two villages, killing 14 Hindus and looting and setting fire to Hindu places of business. The outbreak was sudden and the Hindus were completely defenseless. Indian police have killed several of the raiding tribesmen in quelling the outbreak. Transition. As the nearly 400 million people of India move toward freedom, they face a period of incredible difficulties. Transition from more than a century and a half under British rule to self-government. Transition from hard and fast concepts of communal points of view to a point of view which contemplates the overall good. And finally, whether this can be achieved without the hand of one people turned against the other in war with this question in the balance. And with the acceptance of the fact that if the peoples of India are to live together, then great changes must indeed take place. listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. written and produced by Arnold Marquis. The music was scored and conducted by Henry Russell. Your narrator, John Heaston. (laughs) Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood and is heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. 
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.